Okay. Guys, I started the live stream early for Muhammad Sheikh because he's another brain dog who's now going to help me humiliate his prophet for being a son of Satan. Muhammad Sheikh, are you ready? I'm going to hurt you real bad. And when I say hurt you, not physically. We don't hurt people physically. We hurt them spiritually and destroy their lives. Are you ready? Because you've been barking like a mad dog because I know you're imitating Muhammad. Okay. It says straight out of... Uh, what is this straight out of Modesto? So, Mama Sheikh, are you there? Because you've been barking like a dog. So now I have to teach you a lesson. By the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, Muhammad's God and judge. Are you there? Okay. Now, call me on Skype so I can embarrass you. Are you going to call me on Skype or I'm going to have to embarrass you in the text? I'm going to have to embarrass you in the text. Okay, so you're not. So you're a coward. So you're like Muhammad. You can only... Be brave when you have a band of murdering thugs who can behead people and murder their and rape their women. So you're just like your prophet. But then let's go with the verses that you shamefully misquoted so I can embarrass you. The book of Judges. You keep misquoting Judges. Here's my article that I respond to it. Can you show me anywhere in the book of Judges that what the Benjamites did to the concubine had God's approval? I want you to quote the book of Judges where it says God was pleased that the Benjamites raped and violated a concubine like your filthy prophet does to women. Where does it say that God approved of it? You better answer my question. I'm going to block you and send you to Mecca to kiss the black stone. Where does it say in the book of Judges chapter 19? Here's my article, folks. Here it is for you guys. Click on it. Save it. Where does it say that what the Benjamites did to the concubine? was approved by God, ordered by God. Let me deal with him, guys. Please don't chime in. Because I know you're wicked like your prophet. Show me where it says, and Yahovah approved of what they did and was pleased by it. I have the text in front of me. Don't embarrass yourself because I'm going to punish your prophet. Anytime you lie, I'm going to humiliate your prophet. Quote it for me. I'm going to now have fun with you and look what I'm going to do to your prophet. Hurry up. Sorry, guys. I have to deal with a Mohammedan dog who barks like his prophet. And the Muslims wonder why we can't stand Muhammad and hate Muhammad, the son of Satan, for creating such people. May the Lord Jesus save these Muslims from Muhammad. Sorry, guys. I have to treat a dog accordingly. I don't mean to insult dogs. Okay. Hurry up, Muhammad Sheikh. Where does it say that Jehovah commanded what they did and approved of what they did? And guys, here's my article on what he's quoting or misquoting. It's right there. Because he's like Muhammad who perverts things to his shame and humiliation. That's why he's named after his wicked prophet. Okay. See, now he's going to waste our time because he's a coward like his prophet. His prophet was only a man when he had a group of murdering, raping thugs around him to do his dirty work. There's nothing to hold up. The text is there. It doesn't say it. Stop embarrassing yourself because I'm going to punish you and your prophet. I'm going to really embarrass you. So now, Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 24. Are you ready, Muhammad Sheikh? Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 24. Are you listening? Tell me you're listening. Watch, I'm going to embarrass him now. Surah the nisa chapter 4, verse 24. Don't waste my time. I'm going to block you. Okay. In Surah the nisa 424, it says, It is haram for you, forbidden for you, married woman, except those whom your right hand possess. What does that mean? I want to see if you're going to lie or you're going to be man enough to admit the truth because I have the hadith with me. Sunan Abu Dawood and Sahih Muslim that tell us what this passage is referring to. What does it mean that married women are unlawful for you to have sex with except those married women that your right hand possesses? What does that mean? I said, I'm going to punish your prophet and expose him for the dog that he was because of you, because of your mouth. Renee, you're not paying attention either, sister, but don't help him. Just listen, sister. What does that mean, Muhammad Sheikh? You're wasting my time. 
I even started a couple of minutes early for you. And the Muslims wonder why we hate Muhammad, their prophet. Because this is what he creates. He creates a society of misfits, wicked, dishonest, deceitful, murderers, and rapists. And they need Jesus Christ. May Jesus have pity on your soul and save you from Muhammad. Then it's God. Okay. I'm waiting, Muhammad Sheikh. This is what I'll do to your Shabir Ali and your Farid, Farida. Okay. What does 424 refer to when it says married women are forbidden except those that your right hand possesses? Don't waste my time. Answer. You were barking like a rabid dog before I went live. How come you're silent now? Why are you silent now? Thank you, Mendez. God bless you. How are you, Muhammad bin Bajaras? Muhammad bin Jaras, forgive me for being direct. You have a Muslim here mocking my Lord Jesus, attacking my Lord Jesus, and mocking the Bible. So I'm going to insult him. So Muhammad ibn Jaras, please don't take it personally because I welcome sincere Muslims to my channel to learn. So don't be upset with me because your fellow Muslim, he's now attacking Jesus and blaspheming the word of God. So I'm going to insult him and his prophet. So don't be offended. I'm not directing it to you. Muhammad Sheikh, what does chapter 4 verse 24 refer to? You're wasting my time. Giz, well, you got one minute to answer. You coward. You were barking like a dog, like your prophet, before I went live. Do you guys see how, how he was running his mouth? You guys saw that, right, before I went live, how he's acting tough in the comment section? Okay. You got 30 seconds to answer. See? This is what you do to these dogs. You muzzle them for the glory of Jesus. See? You got 20 seconds. I'm going to send you to Mecca to smooch the black stone like your pagan prophet did. Okay, it's already, it's already in the comment section. You'll see. They'll see. You see the coward? He won't talk. See, he, he's ashamed of his prophet. He's ashamed of his woman raping, woman molesting prophet. See, notice that. Muhammad Sheikh, I'm going to give you a final chance. Where does Judges 19 say that what they did to the concubine was pleasing to God. I know it's hard for you to think logically because you follow Muhammad. Where does Judges 19 say, and God blessed what they did and approved of what they did? And what does chapter 4 verse 24 refer to, Muhammad Sheikh? You're shaming your prophet and you're humiliating your prophet. And I'm going to embarrass you and your prophet if you don't answer. Answer. You got 20 seconds, buddy. Come on, come on, stone smoocher. That black stone ain't helping you, is it? Come on now. I'm trying to give you a chance. No, Muhammad Sheikh, you're a filthy, wicked liar like your prophet. Nowhere does the passage say that God ordered them to fight the Benjamites and rape the concubine because you're so stupid. They attack the Benjamites for raping the concubine. You see how stupid you are? You make Muhammad look intelligent. You wicked liar. You rabid dog. It's the Benjamites that rape the concubine and they attack the Benjamites for raping the concubine. You wicked lying dog. And show me where it says God approved of them raping the concubine. Show me. We're waiting. The black stone's not going to help you, just like it didn't help Muhammad. See, he's wasting our time, guys. See, that's what I said. I'm going to punish and humiliate your prophet every time you open your filthy, blasphemous mouth.
Exactly, you can't find it because it's not there, you wicked liar. That's my point. Now that you got busted and you got humiliated, so he says, I can't find it. Explain to me chapter 4, verse 24, Muhammad Sheikh. What does it mean that married women are forbidden for you except those married women that your right hands possess? What does that mean? What does that mean? Surah Tanisa, chapter 4, verse 24. What is your God saying? That married woman you can't sleep with except married women that your right hand possesses. What does that mean? And by the way, here's my article on judges, guys. Because these wicked Muslims, these filthy lying Mohammedans, misquote Judges 19 to try to cast a bad light on God and his word. That's my article on it. Please, guys, click on it and save it. You need three minutes to find out what Surah 424 means because you need to go to Sheikh Google to help you. Do you need Sheikh Google to help you? Guys, did you click on that link and save that article? Please click that link, save the article, upload it to your own channel, to your own website, study that. Because this will help you shame any Mohammedan or atheist who dares to misquote Judges 19 to show that God approves of gang rape. That's Islam. That's Muhammad. That's not the Bible. All right? Muhammad Sheikh, we don't have three minutes for you. You're a waste of time. You're a joke. You're worse than your own prophet. Okay. What does Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 24 mean? When it says, unlawful for you are married women except those that your right hands possess. What did Muhammad mean when he said that married women that you possess, they're lawful for you? I know what it means. I want you to embarrass your prophet for me before I do. Hurry up. We don't have time for you. What's up, X17 Apologetics? One of your uh, stalkers just stalk followed me on my YouTube channel. That Muhammad Sheikh guy, he now followed me through my YouTube channel attacking the Bible, thanks to you. Uh, David, I asked that you send me some of your viewers, but I didn't ask that you send me the Muslim stalkers. Why are Muslim stalkers coming to my channel? Send me sincere seekers like Muhammad Ibn Jarz, or Christians to help me blow up for the glory of Jesus Christ. But don't be sending me these stalkers who come and attack the Bible, mock the Bible, and mock Jesus. Because I'm not like you, David. I don't tickle ears. So you got Muhammad Sheikh stalking me from last night's session. David, why are you doing this to me, bro? I want a 1,000 viewers for my live stream, but not of this type. Okay. You see what David sends me, Acts 17? I said, hey, bro, tell people to come to my live stream and learn the truth of the Bible by the grace of Jesus Christ who are sincere seekers and believers. Instead, he sends me these stalkers, Muhammad Sheikh, who we kept schooling yesterday and wouldn't learn his lesson. Muhammad Sheikh, you're wasting my time. Yeah, it's, this is like straight, it says straight out of Modesto. Straight out of Modesto. Okay. Mama Chek, I want to begin my lesson. I don't want to hear from you. I know you're very eye candy. Not all I can say, Acts 17 Apologetics, a.k.a. David Wood, if ugliness was a crime, you'd be America's most wanted. They would give you 50 life sentences without parole. And if ugly was a sin, then you'd be committing the unpardonable sin because of your ugliness. Thank God we're saved by the grace of Jesus, not upon looks. You're proved that even ugly people can get saved. And because of the grace of Jesus, they can marry beautiful women. The Lord Jesus blinded your wife because if she could see what you really look like, she would pass out and die of a heart attack. God have mercy on her soul. And by the way, Lindsay, let me correct you again, sister. Let me correct you again. We Christians do not say L-M-A-O. 
we don't say LMAO because that means laughing my aspirations off. Let's be a little more sanitized, even though I can get nasty and swear when I lose my, my temper. Just ask Sai Christian. We say LMBO, LMBO, laugh my buttocks off. That's more appropriate, Lindsay. Just want you to know that. Okay. All right. Are we done with Muhammad Sheikh? Because this gentleman is a joke, as is religion and his prophet. Okay. I am not an apologist. Oh, okay. Now, Muhammad Sheikh, do you want to stay here and listen? Or are you going to attack? So I have to then insult you and embarrass you. Muhammad Sheikh, do you want to listen to the session? Now he's not an apologist. He can't defend his prophet. Neither can Shabir Ali, neither can Farida, neither can your prophet or his God defend Islam. But that's okay. So, Mama Chek, here's the deal. You are welcome to stay here as long as you don't chime in and attack or misquote the Bible. Listen and say nothing. Because I welcome Muslims here who won't attack, misquote, ridicule, or blaspheme my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So if you want to stay, you can. Can you behave yourself? Yes or no? Can you behave yourself? I just want to make sure. Am I wasting my time so I can just get rid of you right now? Because you can't answer questions and you cannot refute the Bible. Well, let's see. I'm going to give him benefit of the doubt. Yeah, okay. Uh, that's good. The same atheist who will destroy the Quran. That's who you're quoting. That's fine. Mama Chek, let me repeat it again. Can you sit here and just listen or are you going to chime in and attack? Because if you start attacking, I'm going to turn my focus on you and it's not going to go, go well for your prophet. Okay, then he just said, sure, guys. Mods, you heard it. Say nothing, just listen. And may the Holy Spirit open your eyes, your ears, and your heart like he's doing for Muhammad Ibn Jaris. All right? So are we now ready, guys, to begin? May the Father, the Lord Jesus, the Son of the Father, Holy Spirit, perfect my sight spiritually and physically. I need glasses, guys. I'm going blind. So are we ready? If we're ready, we can begin. This guy gets me all animated. Before I start the live stream, he's attacking by misquoting Hebrews 5, 7, Mark 10, 45. All of which proves that Muhammad is a false prophet. Right? Are the mods here? I, they are here. I should say, is Protestant here? Is first to last here or no? All right. I guess they're not here, right? If they're not here, I'm going to have to be reading passages on my own. That's fine. All right. It's amazing. For some reason, these mods uh, or Protestant and first last, they don't respond when I tell them I'm live. Anyway. Okay. If everyone's ready, let's begin. Well, I, it's 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We started already. 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, Christos and Esti, go ahead, my brother. It's all right, Captain. Christos and Essie will do it. But let's begin and ask the Lord to help us, to help me to help you, because I'm talking about a very complex issue, a topic that's very perplexing, very complex, and I want to tread lightly by the grace of the Lord Jesus, not to misinterpret or force the passages to say something they don't say, because the Bible is very deep and can confound imperfect, finite, fallen minds such as myself so i need the holy spirit to help me i rarely go on patreon magdalene but it's okay i'll try to do that too right we'll see what happens i need to keep up with the patreon and i want to thank all you supporting me through your prayers and fasting and financially via pay paypal and patreon out of your love for the lord jesus christ you know who you are the lord jesus bless you and reward you for your love for me, his unprofitable servant, right? And keep praying for me, folks. Please, 
Partner with me by praying for me and my daughters and fast that the Lord Jesus will keep me safe from a corrupt judicial system, preserve the money that he's bringing in and sanctify it for the glory of Jesus and use that so I can get planted and build a future for my daughters. It's all for my daughters. What I want to store up on earth is not for me. I want to store it up for my daughters by the grace of Jesus Christ so that I have something to give them if the Lord Jesus tarries and I leave this earth. And I pray I leave this earth before anything happens to them. Please, Lord Jesus. So let's begin and ask the Lord to bless. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you and we need you, Father. We need you, Abba. I need you, Bobby. And everyone here would say an amen that we need you, Father. We need you, Lord Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit of the living God. We need you not just to know the word and to teach the word, but to live the word, to apply the word, to love the word, to proclaim the word and even die for the word, the Holy Bible. Father, have mercy on us when we fail you. Save us from our flesh. Save us from our sinful passions. Save us from our lusts. Save us from our imperfections. And Father, you know what my weaknesses are. Not the least of which is impatience and anger. Save me from, from that for the glory of Jesus. May we have righteous anger, holy indignation. Be zealous for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. And Father, there are people here that you know their situation. You know their situation. I don't, Abba. And I can't help them, but you can because you're God Almighty. You possess infinite riches and you love us with an infinite love. For the sake of your son, the Lord Jesus, wash us in the blood of your son. Fill us with your spirit and be near to us, Father. Whether it's cancer, COVID-19, whatever ailment it is, if it's depression, if it's misery, please, Father, be near to us to flood us in your love, your joy, your peace, reassuring us that you love us and that Jesus Christ, our Lord, is alive. He lives and he intercedes for us and that the Holy Spirit lives in us and help us to become more like Jesus, Father. Less like the world, less like ourselves, and save us, Father, from our flesh, from the world, from the children of Satan, from Satan himself, covering us with the blood of Jesus and our loved ones. Cover my daughters with the blood of Jesus and seal them, seal us by your Holy Spirit. Abba, please hear us. Please, Lord, for the sake of Jesus. And Father, anoint this session. Give me clarity of thought and speech and save me from error and confusion. Because, Father, I don't fully understand this issue. I'm trusting your Spirit to guide me so I don't mislead the people, save me from error, save them from error, and give us illumination into this topic to know it and to know it perfectly and live it out for the glory of Jesus and proclaim it, Abba. We love you, Bobby. Help us to love you more. Help us to love you more, Lord Jesus. Help us to love you more, Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. And give me the health I need the sight to see spiritually and physically, health in my lungs and my chest and my throat to serve the Lord for his glory. Thank you, Abba. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Yahovah Rapha. Yahovah Rapha. Yahovah Rapha. We love you, Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' name. Right? Amen. Okay. Now, Here's the link to the article on Judges 19 that atheists and Muslims misquote. Please read that, upload it to your website, print it out, teach it in your Bible study, because this is one of the objections that Muslims and atheists bring to try to show that the Bible condones gang rape, right, which is a lie from the pit of hell. It's a lie from the pit of hell. Okay. Guys, should I turn on the light? Because here I have, well, let me get the light. I need to get light in it. Hold, hold on. Remember, this is live, so I'm going to do. And by the way, it says straight out of Modesto, Saka. And pray that I keep losing weight and get healthier for the glory of Jesus. Straight out of Modesto, Saka. I bought this shirt when I was in Modesto, California at a Walmart. Right? Right? Straight out of Modesto. Right? Saka. Saka MC. Call me Saya. Yeah. I'm a king of rock. They ain't none higher. Suck it and see. They call me Sire. And pray that I'm not a nuisance to my neighbors and I'm not too loud. Just loud enough not to annoy them, but so they can hear the gospel. All right. I'm the king of rock. They ain't none higher. Suck it and see. They call me Sire. 
then I got to get my muscles back. See? Notice again, Muhammad Sheikh, my friend, I thought you said you can control yourself and shut your mouth. Have you read the book of Judges? Do you know what the book of Judges is, Muhammad Sheikh? Let me answer him real quickly. Do you know what the book of Judges is all about? Have you actually read it? Have you read it? Hold on, guys. Let me deal with him. Christos and Essie. Let me explain it to him. Let's see if he's sincere. Have you read the book? The point of the book of Judges, Muhammad Sheikh, if you read it, is that Israel did not do what God was telling them to do. They kept sinning against God, breaking God's command, worshiping idols, committing sexual immorality, and murder. Okay, Muhammad Sheikh? And the book of Judges is a record of the evil, the sin of the Israelites and how God keeps punishing them. That's the point of Judges. Let me give you some verses to show it. This is in my article, Muhammad Sheikh. This is why if you're honest, you'll never misquote this book again because it's not giving you God's approval. It's showing you that they sinned against God, broke his command, worshipped idols, committed adultery, sexual morality, and murder, and defied God and angered God. And so God allowed nations to come and punish them. Muhammad Sheikh, read this. Guys, I want him to read this. This is from Judges. Judges 17, verse 6. Muhammad Sheikh, this is in the book. Read it carefully. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his eyes. Did you see what it says? The Israelites did what they thought was right. They didn't do what was right in God's eyes. Let me give you another verse. Folks, this is all my article, by the way. Here you go. Here you go. Here you go. Here's another one. Okay. Okay. Muhammad Sheikh, here's the other verse. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Did you catch it again, Muhammad Sheikh? Judges is telling you Israel kept doing what they thought was right, even though what they thought was right was sin against God. They didn't care about the things of God. That's Judges 21, 25. All from my article. But wait, let me give you some more. Okay. Okay, guys. Let me just give them all these verses. Okay. Muhammad Sheikh, read. Everyone read this. Okay, hold on. I got to, oh, man. All right, I got to break this down. Hold on. Hold on. I got to break it down. Judges 3.12, it's too long, but hold on. Let him read it. Okay, here you go. Judges 3.12. Then the children of Israel once more did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened king of Eglon of Moab against Israel because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Judges 3.12. How many more verses, Muhammad Sheikh, must I quote to show you that the book of Judges is telling you Israel was evil. They broke God's command. They did evil in the sight of God. They committed adultery, immorality, worshipped idols, murdered people, all against God. And God was upset with them, so he allowed the nations to come and punish them. So why would you quote Judges 19 against me, Muhammad Sheikh? Is Kobe Bryant a troll? If he is, get him out of here. Okay, I can give you more verses, but read the article. Notice what Muhammad ibn Jaris just said. Lord Jesus, bring you to the truth, Muhammad ibn Jaris, even Muhammad Sheikh. I was taught Sam was a liar and attacked Islam for hatred. I apologize. I at one time thought false stuff about you. I know Muhammad ibn Jaris. That's what they do to poison you from hearing us because we speak the truth. And sometimes we're very tough about it. And we will insult people, insult our God, and attack our word. Okay, now let's get to the topic. Are we ready to get to the topic now? Okay. With that said, please, guys, give me your undivided attention. Help me to help you by focusing on the topic. Don't go into side issues and tangents so I don't get discombobulated because I'm dealing with a very sensitive topic. So if we're ready, let me now sum up 
what we discussed yesterday so I can build on the previous sessions. We're talking about something known among Calvinists as total depravity. Let me explain what that means. Total depravity teaches that because of Adam and Eve and their sin, we who are born from Adam and Eve inherit from them, receive from them a sinful nature, a sinful inclination that disallows us from being able to submit to God and follow God. Okay? This sinful nature has corrupted our mind, our thoughts, our desires, our will, and has corrupted our bodies. Is there with me there? So I'm trying to do justice to this topic. And it's hard for me because there are passages that I'm trying to tread lightly so I don't misinterpret. Because I don't want to force the Bible to agree with me. I want to agree with the Bible by the power of the Holy Spirit. So this doctrine, you don't have to be a Calvinist to believe it. Because I no longer call myself a Calvinist. There are things in Calvinism that are true. There are things in Catholicism that are true and orthodoxy that are true. What I want to be is a biblicist. I want to accept everything and anything the Bible teaches, trusting the Holy Spirit to guide you and me into all truth and correct me where I'm wrong for the glory of Jesus. This doctrine teaches that that sinful nature that you inherited from Adam and Eve has, has and will corrupt and taint the way you see things, the way you perceive things, the way you inter interpret things, it, it has corrupted your thoughts, your desires, your emotions, your inclinations, and your body. It's affected all of you psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. Yes, thank you, Muhammad Ibn Jaz. Lisa, don't engage him in side talk. He wants to focus. At the same time, though, here's... The other side, the caveat. I did say, Christian, I already announced to come. All right. At the same time, though, focus with me. Because human beings are created in the image of God, that image of God is still within us. Good, Ariel. I like that. That It's still within us. It hasn't been effaced. It hasn't been wiped out, which is why even unbelievers even those who are not born again get convicted when they do something wrong, get convicted when they do something that they know goes against God, right? This is true of even unbelievers, even those who weren't born of the spirit yet. In fact, those of you from Christian backgrounds, before you got saved, before you even cared about the Bible or Jesus Christ, how many times you did things that you knew was wrong according to God and felt bad doing it, but you still did it anyway? You still did it anyway. Right? Okay. Why were you feeling bad? Because that's the image of God in you. Sin hasn't erased that image. Because you are created in the image of God and God's moral law has been written in your hearts, in your conscience, in your mind. The Spirit uses that image. The Holy Spirit uses that image. Even while as an unbeliever to convict you to feel guilty and remorse about what you're doing. But then what happens? The more you go against that conviction and the more you resist the Holy Spirit using the image in you to convict you, the more hardened you become in your sin and the less you care eventually. You reach a point where you don't care anymore. That's when you become so hardened, you just don't care, and then you end up justifying your sin. You understand what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So if you go back to yesterday's session, you have to re-listen to it, because I'm going to build on it. Because you have a sinful nature... That sinful nature arises in you to make you sin. And that sinful nature makes you incapable of doing the things that God desires of you. Even though you have the desire to do it and want to do it, but you can't because sin has ensnared you. So let me repeat that point. A heart that's evil cannot allow you to carry out 
what that image of God in you tells you to do. God's law to God's satisfaction. You may have the desire to do it, but because of sin, you're not able to do it. And so then there becomes that war in you. You want to please God, but you keep succumbing. Let me give you a very bad analogy. I'm trying to make sense out of this. So bear with me, and I'm trusting the Spirit to save me from error because I don't want to be mistaken. How many of you know, and I know this personally, drug addicts, in the beginning, it was a choice to do drugs, okay? But because they kept doing the drug, they reached a point, it was no longer a choice, they were enslaved to it, and they keep doing it, though they hate doing it. And every time they do it, they feel guilty and miserable, and they hate themselves, but they're not able not to do it because they're ensnared. Do you know people like that? I know people like that. Thank the Lord that God saved you, Sean. That's sin. That's sin. That's what sin does to you. You know God is real. The law of God is there. You desire to do it, and every time you try, sin causes you to fail. And every time you fail, you feel convicted and miserable, but you're hopeless and helpless against it. Until the Holy Spirit then makes you alive, and now gives you the power to resist him and overcome it. So let me explain that again. Let me explain it. The person who's not born again, at one point in his life is alive. But then when that person becomes aware, God exists and God has a law that God expects me to follow. Then sin in your flesh springs to life, springs to action, and then makes you break the law of God. So now you stand condemned. And deserve death. But because the image of God is in you, that image of God moves you to want to do the law, but sin stops you from doing it. And now it's a war that you can't win because sin is too strong for you. Sin is too powerful. And every time you want to do something good, you keep doing something bad to undo the good you're doing and leaves you in misery until the spirit makes you alive. And now you're no longer controlled by sin. Now you can actually defeat sin and overcome sin if you walk in the life and the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit does that for you, Ramsa, not you. And I already gave you the verses yesterday. So I don't want to repeat what I discussed yesterday. That's why, please, go back, listen to part five, and re-listen to it, and re-re-listen to it until you understand this. Because I want to build on what I said yesterday. Are you with me there? So I am not saying that if you are enslaved to sin, dead in sin, you can, on your own, apart from the Spirit, defeat sin and live for God. No, that's why you must be born again. You understand now why you must be born again? What I am saying is, though you may be ensnared by sin and dead in sin, still because the image of God is in you, there's a desire to want to live for God and a desire to want to obey God. But sin makes it impossible for you to do so until the spirit makes you alive, causes you to be born again. Right? And we went through those passages yesterday. Right? Exactly, Vine. Romans 7, verses 7 to 25 was one of them. Okay? But now here's the danger. Here's the danger. Jay, I didn't say you won't be sinning. What I'm saying is once you're born again, now you have the Holy Spirit to resist and overcome it. So the more you walk in unity with the Spirit, the less you'll sin. But since none of us can perfectly walk with the Spirit, we're still going to sin and succumb to it. You know why? Because most of our life has been spent sinning. So sinning has become second nature. What the Spirit teaches us is teaches us to do is to die to that second nature. In other words, I've sinned so much that it's second nature for me to sin. It is easy for me to sin, sin. But the Spirit comes over to now train you. This is why the Bible describes the Christian life as spiritual exercise, spiritual training. The more time I spend in the gym and the healthier I eat, 
The healthier I look and the more muscular I become. That's your Christian walk. The more time I walk in union with the Spirit and perform those spiritual exercises that the Spirit has given me to do by His power, such as prayer, fasting, reading the Bible, singing praises to God, praying to God, fellowshipping, the less I'll sin and the stronger I'll be against sin's desire to cause me to stumble. That's not my analogy, Sean. That's Paul's analogy. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 to 27. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 to 27. And he talks about the Christian walk being a race. It's a, it's a race, right? 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 8. Are you with me there? So to answer your question, you still have sin in your flesh when you're born again. So now sin cannot make you stumble, but sin will do everything it can to try to tempt you to stumble. Now let me explain the difference again, because I got to go into the scriptures. Before you're born again, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 to 27. Before you were born again, you were powerless against sin. Sin makes you stumble. Though you desire not to sin, though you desire to obey God, you can't because of that sin. But once you're born again, sin cannot make you sin. It will do everything it can to tempt you to sin. But the more you walk in union with the Spirit, the more you discipline yourself spiritually, the more power you'll have to resist that sin and overcome it. You with me there? Am I making sense? So I want to make sure I don't confuse you. I am not saying that if you are dead in sin, enslaved to sin, you can, apart from the Spirit, the grace of God, overcome sin and obey God. No, you can't. That's the whole purpose of being born again. What I'm saying is, let me repeat this and let me know if I'm clear. What I'm saying is, though you have a sinful nature that makes it incapable of you carrying out God's law, you still have the image of God in you that convicts you to want to please God and do his law, and you have the desire to do it, but not the power to act upon it until the Holy Spirit sets you free and makes you alive. But now here's the danger. Here's the danger. The more you walk in your sin, and the more you go against your conscience and conviction, that the Holy Spirit brings upon your heart, using the law in your heart, the image in which the Spirit created you in, that divine image, the more you go against that, instead of then crying out to God like Paul did, what did Paul do in Romans 7? Wretched man that I am, who can save me from this body of death? See, he cried out, Romans 7, 24 and 25, and God heard his plea and set him free by the blood of Jesus. You see the point? The more you resist that and the more you ignore it, then you can reach a point. You now, when Paul said that, he was talking about the condition of someone who wasn't born again. No, Jay. Romans 7, Paul is putting himself in the shoes of someone who wasn't born again. He's describing himself in the state, in that condition of someone who wasn't made alive yet. Okay. The more you then... Resist that convicting work of the Spirit, the Spirit using the law in your heart, the image in which you're created to convict you. The more you resist that and the more you indulge in your sin, then you reach a point in, in which you could care less about the things of God anymore. You become so encrusted in your sin that now your sin defines you and you're defined by your sin. And now you could care less about what God says and law says. Now you justify your sin and immorality. And you see that all around you. What are you seeing people doing? Justifying homosexuality. Justifying transgenderism. Justifying infanticide, abortion, and calling it pro-choice. They are now dead 
to the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. They are dead to the law written in their hearts. Their conscience has been seared, and they don't care anymore. In other words, as Sai Christian said, you become reprobate. You have now grieved the Holy Spirit and insulted the Holy Spirit and resisted the Holy Spirit that you've reached the point where the Holy Spirit is done with you. This is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. You get it? And I gave you the passages yesterday. So for those passages, please go back, re-listen or listen, and re-re-listen to part five. You must, because I want to now provide some further examples of the effects of sin upon the human race. Are we ready? Are we ready? Exactly. You're writing your name in Greek, Teleotaios. Teleotaios. Ato, ato krator. Ato krator. Teleotaios. Ato krator. Sorry, I'm pronouncing it the way the Erasmians do. So forgive me, brother. Don't stone me. Teleotaios. Ato krator. Okay. No, uh, Anish, Romans 7 is not about the born-again believer. Anish, Romans 7 is about someone who's dead in sin before he's made alive by the Spirit. Now, what's the difference? Now that you're born again, Anish, you still have sin in your flesh, but sin doesn't control you and can't make you sin. Sin will do everything it can to cause you to stumble in sin, but it can't make you do it. Because now you have the Holy Spirit empowering you to resist it if you walk in union with the Holy Spirit. Okay, Anish? Clear? Okay, can I now let's let's look at some passages in Job. Remember that some of the statements of Job are referring, Sean, God bless you, brother are referring to Israelites who have demonstrated a pattern of resisting the Spirit's work in their lives, of defying God repeatedly, spurning their backs on God's word. So remember that context. I don't know about learn about Islam because if it's not related to the topic, I may block you. So, you know, take a chance. The risk is all yours. Remember that some of these statements are directed to the Israelites. Keep this in mind. Some of the passages are directed to the Israelites who've shown a repeated pattern of turning their backs on God, spurning God's word, defying God to his face, and indulging willfully in idolatry, sexual immorality, and murder. So keep that in mind, right? Are you with me? We must first interpret a passage in light of its own context. Not you, Muhammad Sheikh, someone else. Are you with me there? So some of these statements do have meaning for us, but we want to first see what it means to the audience that it was written to. So keep in mind, Jeremiah is addressing Israel, and he's talking about Israel's repeated pattern, repeated habit of opposing God's prophets, of defying God to his face, of breaking the covenant, and indulging in idolatry, immorality, and murder willingly. That's the audience. So what is their pattern? They're showing a pattern of indulging their sinful desire as opposed to crying out to God to deliver them from their sinful bondage. In other words, they're loving their sin more than God. Keep that in mind, right? Are you with me there? Keep that in mind. Yes, I do. It's a Torah. Breath. Is that clear? Are you with me? Are you keeping this in mind? It's addressing a people whose pattern has been to indulge their sinful desires and justify them Instead of crying out to God and saying, God, deliver me from this body of death like Paul did. Okay, now with that said, let's go to the book of Jeremiah. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4. 
Jeremiah 4, verse 4. Let's read it. Circumcise yourselves to Jehovah and take away the foreskin of your hearts. You see? Circumcise yourself, Jehovah, and take away the foreskins of your hearts, you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire or burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Did you catch it? Here is the Old Testament exhortation to be born again. This is Old Testament language that the prophets used to show Israelites, you need to be born again. You need to be made new. You need to be changed. You need a spiritual circumcision because that evil foreskin is hindering you from carrying out God's will. So seek God to be circumcised. Right? Are you seeing it there? Jeremiah 4 verse 4. Is that clear? Are you getting it? Before I move on. Okay. Jeremiah 6 verse 10. Jeremiah 6, verse 10. Watch here. Very sensitive topic and a vitally important topic, and I got to tread lightly. May the Lord Jesus bless this session and bless you to understand and save me from error and bring more. We want the numbers increased for the glory of God. Uh, glory of God. Jeremiah 6, 10. Notice what he says. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Indeed, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot give heed. Behold, the word of the Lord is, and then he cuts off in midstream. This brother who helps me to help you, and I don't pay him to help me to help you. And so for some reason, that passage is cut off in midstream. Let me help him out. Huh. Ah, Protestant. If I die of a heart attack, you're going to be the reason. Besides, I, Christian, my ex-wife. Did you post all of it now or no? You again? Okay. Yeah, you didn't post all of it. I got to fire this guy, dude. This dude who suffers with Alzheimer's. Okay, here you go. Okay. His, Bible, his Bible cuts off. Here you go. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? See their ears are closed and they cannot listen. Indeed, the word of the Lord is a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. Did you see now who he's talking to? Did you catch what he just said? No, actually it fits. Jeremiah 6.10. He's talking to a people. He's talking to a people who have now been so encrusted by their sin that now sin defines them and they're defined by their sin. And they're completely dead to the law of God and the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. Do you see the group here? In other words, he's talking to a group that have become reprobate. Exactly, Lindsay. Do you understand? So there are Israelites that reached the point that they were so now dead in sin that that conviction of their heart by the Holy Spirit, using the law to convict them and their conscience to convict them because they bore the image of God, they had died to it. Their conscience became seared and they were now dead to that conviction. Exactly, Vine. You're getting the point? If you interpret Scripture, light of Scripture, and interpret it correctly, that's the interpretation, Vine. Not everyone has reached that point. David Julius, I love you, my brother from a different mother. It fits because it's only 199 characters. Come on, dude. Here. 200 character limit. There you go. It's 190, actually, not 199. I know you're trying to help Protestant. Don't help my brother because I'm the only one who can help Protestant and discipline Protestant because I love him enough to discipline him. It's called tough love. But now focus. Exactly, Vine. Vine. This is not referring to the plight of all humans. It's referring to that person who's reached the point of reprobation where God says, I'm done. Right, Vine? You're seeing it now? This is why I say take the audience in consideration. 
take the context and consideration. The prophets are talking to the Israelites who've shown this repeated pattern generation after generation of giving in to their sinful bondage instead of crying out to God to be set free. And now they've been so encrusted and ingrained by that sin. They are now dead to that convicting work of the Holy Spirit and could care less about God and his law. Minds are too vine because I used to misapply these passages and I pray I'm not doing so now that I'm applying them correctly. Jeremiah 17 verse 10. Yep, the power of sin is the law. I'm sorry, Jeremiah 17 verse 9. Jeremiah 17 verse 9. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Eileen, hold on. Let me finish the topic. Guys, don't go off topic. Stay on topic, please. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? See, this is what I was talking about, that sin nature. Sin has affected your mind. Your desires, your emotions, your volition, and he's, it's even affected your body. A heart that's evil will not allow you to carry out God's law. But what does the Spirit do? Let's explain this. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. What does the Spirit do? The Spirit takes the image of God in you, the law written in your heart, and uses that to convict you. Though you are powerless to submit... Still, you're not at a point in which you don't get convicted for your sin and feel remorse for succumbing to sin. And the Spirit uses that to lead you to cry out to God, God, my heart is evil. I need to be saved. Change my heart. And God does that. But it's the work of the Spirit convicting you of your inability and powerlessness against your sinful nature to cry out for salvation. You understand the point? I don't understand why when I told people, stay on topic, don't go off topic, Lindsay and Faith Love think they're doing Eileen a service by telling her what version to read and ignoring my wishes and disrespecting me. Are you with me there? You understand what these passages are teaching in context? I'm going very slow, and I'm trying to explain it so that it makes sense and that God will help me to understand it much better. Okay? So let me repeat so you don't understand. I'm not saying that if you're dead in sin, meaning before you're born again, okay, before you're born again, you are able on your own to overcome sin and submit to God. Absolutely not. Otherwise, then why would you need to be born again? What I'm saying is, though you're ensnared by sin, and sin makes it makes it impossible for you to do the things of God and submit to God's law, to God's satisfaction, you're not so dead as to be unaware of your condition and unaware of your sinfulness and your need of help by the grace of God to be set free from that sinful inclination and that's the work of the Spirit in you to convict you that sin has control over you. Sin has ensnared you. Sin won't allow you to submit to God. You need God to set you free and cause you to be born of the Spirit, born from above, born again. Cry out to Him. And when you do, the Spirit transforms you for the glory of Christ. Acting as crutches? You've completely misunderstood, and I'm offended by that analogy. Apart from the Spirit, you are paralyzed. And as a paralyzed man, you're crying out to the Spirit to give you the power to walk on your feet again. Yes, it does, Cherville. You must fast. The Lord said we're, we're to fast. Am I confusing anyone yet? Or is it making sense? Is it making sense? I'm going very slow because this is such a complex topic that you have Christians who are divided. And for years I taught one view of these passages that right now I'm seeing 
I was not completely wrong, but I wasn't completely right. And I want to be very reverent in the way I go about explaining it because I want to be faithful to Scripture. Okay, so if you're with me, now let's go to the other passage. Jeremiah 24, verse 7. Jeremiah 24, verse 7. Jeremiah 24, verse 7. There are still things I'm wrestling with, struggling to understand. And if I don't understand them, I'll admit it. If I do, I'll share it. Jeremiah 24, 7. Then I will give them a heart to know me. You see it? An evil heart replaced with a heart to know God. That I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. You see it? That evil heart, God replaces with a heart that desires him and submits to him and loves him. You catch it there? You see it here? Jeremiah 17, 9. This heart of yours is evil. You need a heart transplant. Be aware that you're evil. Be aware that you are enslaved to this evil heart. And cry out to God. As the Spirit is convicting your conscience to be aware, I'm a sinner and I'm a wretch and I have no power to overcome my condition. God, I'm like a drug addict addicted to this drug and I hate it. Set me free, oh God. And he shows up in mercy. Right? Jeremiah 32, 39 to 40, but we're going to read 38. Jeremiah 32, 38 to 40. Jeremiah 32, 38 to 40. 38 to 40. They shall be my people and I will be their God. Then I will give them one heart. See, I have to give them this heart. And one way that they may fear me forever. For the good of them. For their benefits. So I don't punish them anymore. And their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. That I will not turn away from doing them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. This is being born again, a new creation, made anew. When you are aware and realize I am powerless and helpless against this sin in my body and the members of my flesh. I am powerless against it. I cannot overcome it. The more I want to do God's word and his law, the more sin causes me to stumble. I can't defeat this enemy in me. And I can't defeat the influence of Satan. Oh, God, save me. But again, let me put it in, protect, in perspective. If you are grieving over your sinful condition and your hopeless situation... That's because the Spirit is convicting you. That's because the Spirit is moving you through the law written in your heart and the image of God, which you still retain because it hasn't been erased from you. So the Spirit is using that. Be aware you're sinning against God and you have no power against this sin. You need Jesus and his blood to wash you and you need me to make you alive. And once you come to that realization and cry out, the sun will set you free. But what happens if you keep resisting and you keep resisting and you keep resisting? The more you resist, the more you indulge, the more you justify, then you reach a point where even the Spirit says, enough. Enough. It's over. And now you'll be defined by your sin. And now you'll be justifying your sin. And you see that all around you. You even see that with the example I gave you earlier, drug addicts. You have even drug addicts that reach the point they've given into it to, to it. And they know this is their life and they don't care anymore. Right? I have to use that analogy because this analogy helps us understand that you can reach a point where you just don't care anymore. Right? You, and you're aware of what I'm talking about, right? You get to a point, you don't care anymore. You just give into it, and now you justify it, and now this is, characterizes your life. And you are okay living in that bondage. 
It now defines you. It is now your life. The same thing with sin. And sin manifests itself differently for each individual. The sin that may have ensnared you may be porn, like people keep saying. Sexual immorality. Whatever it is. Because sin is manifold. It's not one particular sin that is common to all. Each of us have our own unique sins that we struggle with. You may struggle with pornography. I may struggle with gambling. I may struggle. It, but that's the, that's the sad reality of sin. Sin is manifold. There are manifestations of sin that people can become entangled in. And not every person is entangled in the same sin. Another sin that you can be entangled in is the sin of religiosity and spirituality. That's another sin that you can be entangled in. Because, folks, you have people out there that are very religious and spiritual. And they are so happy and content and satisfied with their religion and spirituality that they think they don't need Jesus whatsoever. That too is sin. It was the sin of the Pharisees, the sin of the Sadducees that made them think, we don't need you, Jesus, because our religious lifestyle, our spiritual practices are good enough. That too is a manifestation of sin in which you can be entangled by deceiving you into making you think you don't need Jesus. You understand? That too is sin. You see how sneaky sin is? How cunning sin is? How deceitful sin is? Sin and Satan don't care what sin entangles you. As long as it prevents you from coming to God on God's terms and accepting the Savior that God has provided and his work of salvation, Jesus Christ. Can I prove that to you from Scripture? So there is a sin that's less obvious, that's more dangerous than the sin of porn, the sin of fornication, the sin of pride, even though this is a form of pride, it's the sin of religiosity slash spirituality. Can I show that to you? Romans 10, verses 1 to 4. Do you know why? Because this particular sin gives the appearance of being righteous and holy and spiritual. So what's more dangerous? That which isn't obviously sinful or that which is obviously sinful? Obviously, the thing that's more dangerous is the thing that doesn't look like it's sin. But it's, it's presented as piety, as spirituality, as religious, religiosity. That's even more dangerous than porn, than adultery, than fornication, than greed. Let me show you. Here he goes, Romans 10, verses 1 to 4. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They are zealous for the God of Israel, but their zeal is based on ignorance because they are ignorant of God's plan of salvation and or reluctant to submit to God's plan of salvation. Because notice what he says. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law, end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Let me explain what Paul just said. My people, the Jews, they're zealous for God. And they're zealous to keep the law. And they're zealous to be justified by the law. They're zealous to fast. They're zealous to pray. They're zealous to give their wealth to the widow, to the orphan, to the needy. They're even zealous to die for their religion, like Muslim jihadists. Muslims are zealous to pray five times a day, to fast the entire month of Ramadan, to give to, to the poor, 
to the needy, to the jihadi. They're zealous, and they're even zealous to be killed and killed for Allah. They're zealous. You with me there? But it's a zeal that's misplaced because the path that they're embarking on is a path to hell. It's not God's path to salvation and attaining righteousness. That too is sin. And so you have people who are so content with their religion, the Hamza Yusufs of the world, the Yasser Qadis of the world, the Osama Bin Ladens of the world, the Tovia Singers of the world. They are so content, satisfied in their religion that they wouldn't even think of giving their life to Jesus as their Lord and Savior, as God's Son, and their only means of reconciliation with an infinitely holy God. You understand now? And the danger of that path, you can be so encrusted by it that you've reached a point that there's no return. In other words, no matter how many times you hear the gospel, how many times has Shabir Ali heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? How many times has Satovia Singer heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? And what's their repeated response? Rejection, distortion, attacking it, mocking it, perverting it. And so I wouldn't be surprised that a dog like Tovia Singer, a wicked, filthy dog like Tovia Singer, and a wicked charlatan and demon like Shabir Ali have reached the point of reprobation. They are now so reprobate, they have grieved the Holy Spirit so much, it's over for them. Now, I don't know that for a fact, but I wouldn't be surprised. Because who has heard the gospel as thoroughly and as much as Shabir Ali has? You see the point? So are you understanding what the Bible is teaching about sin and its effects? See, Muhammad Sheikh fell for it. See, this is the satanic line. This is why I said this sin is the most deceitful and cunning. Notice what he said? Shabir Ali is respectful. Even Satan can appear respectful and is an angel. Okay, is it making sense, this interpretation of the scripture? People can be so defined by their sin and, in, and so hardened by their sin, they've reached a, a level of reprobation, reprobate minds, and the Spirit has been so grieved by their rejection of the Spirit, their resistance of the Spirit, they've now blasphemed the Spirit, and the Spirit has nothing to do with them. And now the Spirit hands them over to what they want. Okay, is everyone clear on that? Is it making sense what I'm saying? Man, we need about 250 for this session, if not more. Preach Christ LA. If they reach a point of reprobation, that means it's over for them. God is done with them because they've now blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And what did Jesus say? Once you've blasphemed the Spirit, this is a sin that will never be forgiven. Is that clear? This is the most dangerous manifestation of sin. The sin of religiosity slash spirituality that makes you feel safe and content without the work of Jesus. Where you end up mocking the cross of Jesus, blaspheming the cross of Jesus. Pretty much saying that Jesus shed his blood for nothing because I don't need his blood to save me and reconcile me to God because my religion is enough to save me before God. I hope this is giving you insight and understanding what the Bible is teaching. Is that clear? Let's not go on side tangents. Focus. I'm going very slowly because I want to make sure... This makes sense. 
And that's what Paul said about Israel. My people are zealous, but their zealousness is not based on the knowledge of God. The revelation that God has given that if you want to be righteous before God, you got to submit to Christ and his cross. They think that they can attain righteousness before God by keeping the law. When the pattern of the Old Testament shows repeatedly, our people have failed miserably to submit to God because the purpose of the law was to show us and our ancestors sin is too powerful. We are helpless against it. We need a savior. And once we realize that by the work of the spirit convicting us and cry out for the savior, then Jesus shows up to save us. That was the purpose of the law. Clear? Let's go to Jeremiah 13, 23. We're almost done with this. Jeremiah 13, 23. We may have a customer, some Muhammadan wants to call me. Jeremiah 13, 23. So after this, we'll do it because it won't take me much to do it because I just needed to go through these passages. Okay. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? Then may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. This is referring to the reprobate, a passage that I often misapplied. Notice what it's saying. When you're so accustomed to doing evil, you reach a point where it's impossible for you to do good anymore. And so you become like the leopard that cannot shed its spots. But notice this is referring to the person who's so accustomed to doing evil that now evil defines them and they can't do otherwise. This is the point you don't want to reach. You catch it? Sadly for me, I used to misapply this passage. Now I understand it. You who are accustomed to evil. But remember and go back and listen to the session yesterday. Romans 7 verses 7 to 25. This could not refer to Paul because Paul said, even when I was dead in sin, I agonized over the fact I kept breaking the law. It grieved me to break the law. I wanted to do it so badly and I couldn't do it to God's expectations and satisfaction. And then I realized I needed God to do something for me. And that's where Jesus showed up and made himself known to me. See, Paul wasn't one of those resisting the spirit. The spirit convicted Paul and showed Paul, Paul, you're not able to carry the law because sin keeps making you stumble and break it. And the Spirit kept working in Paul's heart. God, I don't want to break the law. I don't want to keep failing you. I want to do what you demand, but I can't. I'm failing God. See, the Spirit working in Paul. Paul didn't resist the Spirit. Paul accepted what the Spirit was showing him. Paul, you need a Savior. And Jesus showed up. Right? Jesus showed up. In fact, why was Paul persecuting Christians? Why was Paul getting Christians in prison and killed? Because he thought he was pleasing God. Like the jihadis, like Osama bin Laden, right? ICE, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, who think if they kill the infidel, Allah will ple be pleased with them and will increase their chances of entering Jannah. Paul thought, if I persecute these Jews who are insulting God by worshiping a crucified Jew as God, then God will be pleased with me and I'll, I'll merit extra brownie points. He didn't do it because he believed Jesus is God. He did it because he thought Jesus was false. And he thought that his fellow countrymen we're blaspheming God and committing idolatry. Right? So even that act of persecuting the church was because of his zeal to please the God of Israel. So God saw the motive of his heart. He thinks by doing this, he's getting closer to me. He doesn't realize he's actually opposing me and my plan of salvation. So then Jesus shows up. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And the glorious light of Christ blinded him. Who are you, Lord? 
This voice is from heaven, so I know this is God's voice, and this light is the light of God. But why would God say, I'm persecuting him? I'm not persecuting you. I'm working for you. So God, why are you saying I'm persecuting you? And then the next sentence blew him away. You are right, I am the Lord. Because he said, who are you, Lord? That's what he says in Acts 9, verses 1 to 5. Who are you, Lord? So he knew this is the Lord. But wait, I thought I knew the Lord. But if I knew the Lord, why is the Lord saying I'm persecuting him? Who then are you really, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus. Whoa. You are the God of Israel? You're the God of the prophets? You're the God of the Old Testament? The one I thought was a false Messiah whom God condemned and accursed turns out to be the God of my ancestors, and I didn't know that? Yes, you didn't, but now you do. 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 15. Let me show you that. 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 15. Okay. 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 15. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, watch here, who has enabled me, empowered me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Pay attention. He's praising Jesus, thanking Jesus, praying to Jesus. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. I didn't know any better. I didn't know any better. So the Lord Jesus was merciful because he took into consideration I was doing it in ignorance. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundantly. He abundantly graced me and favored me and showed me mercy with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. So he gave me faith in him and to love him. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I'm the worst of sinners. Why? 1 Timothy 1.16. 1 Timothy 1.16. Watch here. Watch what he says. 1 Timothy 1.16. However, for this reason I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all longsuffering, his patience as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. What does he mean? If Jesus could even put up with me and be patient with me, though I was persecuting his church and getting... Believers kill and then forgive me and grace me and enable me to love him and trust in him by the spirit convicting me. Then there's hope for the rest of you. There's hope for all of you. If he can take a blasphemer like me, I didn't know I was blaspheming him. I didn't know he was God. I didn't think he was a murderer. Then there's hope for the rest of you. And then he breaks out in praise, which is what you should be doing when you read this. 1 Timothy 1.17. Now he breaks out in praise. 1 Timothy 1.17. Watch here. Watch what he does. He breaks out in praise. Now to the king eternal, immortal, never dies, invisible to the human eye. He can appear visibly if he wants. To God who alone is wise. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. That's the response of someone who's made alive, born again, shown mercy. Who hasn't constantly resisted the spirit to grieve the spirit to reach a point where he's blaspheming the spirit and the spirit gives up on you. Mahdi, guys, he just insulted Jesus, so don't attack me. Your mother is a filthy whore to give birth to a bastard whore like you because you're upset because you don't know which of the Shia fathered you, those 20 Shia that your mother slept with doing muta. You filthy whore. It's an insult to call your mother a whore for blaspheming Jesus. Guys, you get upset with me, get lost. He just called Jesus the OG, this wicked whore. Okay? He insulted Jesus Christ. So guys, you get upset, get lost. Anyone who insults my Jesus, I'm going to insult you and your mother. Your poor mother. Okay. Okay, now you with me there? Calling Jesus what he did. Did you guys see what he just called Jesus? Anyway. Now with that said, that's the response 
you break out in praise of the living God who showed you mercy. Now let's go to Deuteronomy 10, 16. We're almost done. Yeah, the poor mom. She didn't know she was going to give birth to a bastard dog like that, Hapsa. She didn't know. Yeah, don't read it, Christus and Esti. He said something so blasphemous. You know he's not a Muslim. He's a filthy bastard of the devil. Deuteronomy 10, 16. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. Circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. You catch it? The Israelites had reached the point of depravity where they kept resisting God, complaining against God, murmuring against God, doubting God. In fact, guys, let me show you how wicked they were. God shows up in a cloud, a pillar of cloud by day, which then becomes a pillar of fire by night. They see the cloud by day and the fire by night. They see the plagues. They see the Red Sea split open. They enter the wilderness. They see the cloud descend on the mount. This is Exodus chapter 19, Exodus chapter 20. They hear God's voice audibly. And from the sound of his voice, they're trembling with fear. And they tell Moses, we don't want to hear his voice anymore. You speak for us. And God says, that's good. Now they will learn to fear me. So now I won't speak audibly. Though they see the cloud and know I'm here in their midst. What do they do? They fashion calves, golden calves with the cloud right there. They complain there's no water, there's no meat, and they do this for 40 years. No matter how many signs they see, no matter the fact that they hear God's voice audibly and see the cloud by day and fire by night, knowing that God's there, and yet in his face, they defy him. In his face, they commit idolatry. In his face, they're doubting him. Where's the water? Where's the food? Are we going to die here? Weren't there enough graves in Egypt that you brought us to the? And you see why God says these people? They're so encrusted and engraved in their sin that none of them are going to enter the promised land except Joshua and Caleb. Did you know that generation that came out, none of them entered the promised land except the children? Grown men and women came into the land with their children. All of them died. Even Moses died in the wilderness, except Joshua and Caleb. Only the next generation entered. The children had now grown up. They become men and women. You will enter, but your parents are all going to die in the wilderness. Even you, Moses. Moses died in the wilderness. Aaron died in the wilderness. Miriam died in the wilderness. The only two from that first generation was Joshua and Caleb. That's how fed up God was with them. So what does he say to them? Do you not see how desperately in need you are of spiritual circumcision to be born again? In front of me, hearing my voice audibly, seeing the cloud, the thunder, you know, the peals of lightning and, and, and fire, and you still have the audacity to defy, defy me in my face, commit idolatry in my face, Whine and complain and murmur in my face and doubt my ability to sustain you in the wilderness. And you think you don't need to be born again and you don't need a savior? Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And Jehovah your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord Jehovah your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. You see what he's saying? Does it now sink in, my people? Do you now see how corrupted and tainted the human condition is? Do you see that you're utterly powerless against sin? Sin is so strong in you that in front of my face, you would choose to sin than obey me. Your sin is so strong, it makes you defy me and doesn't allow you to fear me. Do you catch it? Do you see how utterly helpless and hopeless we are against sin in us? Are you, you understand what I just shared with you? I don't know if you're catching it. The Israelites are seeing God visibly. They hear his voice audibly. They saw the plagues, the Red Sea split, and they're still complaining, 
still committing idolatry, still committing immorality, still doubting God's ability to give them water and feed them. Do you understand how powerful sin is? That even if God shows up in front of you, sin will still make you sin against him unless God sets you free, causes you to be born of the Spirit, and applies the saving benefits of Christ to you. So you see what he's teaching them. The condition of humanity after the fall is such that if I don't set you free, if I don't give you the spirit to make you alive, and if I don't provide a savior to atone for your sins against God and to do the law according to my standards on your behalf, you'll be left to die and rot and be cut off from me forever. So do you see that you need a savior? Do you see you can't do it apart from me, apart from the savior that I will provide and apart from the spirit? And if you say, yes, I need you, I can't do it. God will show you mercy. So you see what the point is, right? God is teaching them and us after the fall of Adam and Eve. After the fall of Adam and Eve, the human condition is helpless and hopeless to do what God desires, though you may have a desire to do it and to live up to God's standards, unless and until God provides salvation for you, which he does, Jesus Christ our Lord, the God-man, and gives you the Holy Spirit of life to empower you to resist it and overcome it. You want me there? Is it making sense what God is doing here? Now, I want you to write down. I can't read it right now, but I want you to write down Deuteronomy 31, 14 to 29. Read it at your own leisure because I want to end it with one passage. Deuteronomy 31, 40, 14 to 29. Write that down. Deuteronomy 31, 14 to 29. God already tells Israel before Moses died, when you enter the land, you're going to break my covenant, commit idolatry, sexual morality, murder, because of your pattern. Your pattern is, instead of crying out to me to save you from your sinful condition, you indulge in your sinful passions and justify them and become defined by your sin, leaving no, no, no choice to punish you. Right? Okay, now, let's go to do, Joshua 24. Let's read Joshua 24, 14 to 18. Joshua 24, 14 to 18. Now, therefore, fear the Lord, Jehovah. Joshua talking to the Israelites. They've now entered the promised land. Serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve Jehovah. And if it seems evil to you to serve Jehovah, the Lord, right? If it seems evil to you, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me in my house, we will serve Jehovah, the Lord. Now watch. So the people answered and said, far be it from us that we should forsake Jehovah, the Lord, to serve other gods. Now watch. For Jehovah, our God, is he who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way, right? In all the way that we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And Jehovah, the Lord, drove out from before us all the people, including the Amorites who dwelt in the land. We also will serve Jehovah for he is God. Now notice what they said. We will serve Jehovah. God forbid we serve other gods. What are you talking about? We'll serve Jehovah. We'll submit to him, right? Notice the desire is there, right? Do you see the desire? The desire is there. We will serve Jehovah. Are you with me there? We will obey him. He's our God. What are you talking about? We will never disobey God. But now notice the response. Joshua 24, 19 to 28. Notice the response. Joshua 24, 19 to 28. But Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve Jehovah. 
for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake Jehovah and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done you good. But now notice their insistence. And the people said to jo Joshua, no, but we will serve Jehovah. So Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen Jehovah for yourselves to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. Do you see the arrogance? Now, therefore, he said, put away the foreign gods. Let's finish it. And I'm going to show you their mistake. Okay. So Joshua made a covenant. Now, therefore, he said, put away the foreign gods, which are among you, and incline your heart to Jehovah, God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, Jehovah, our God, we will serve, and his voice will obey. Okay. So Joshua made a covenant with, with the people that day and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Then Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, the book of Moses. And he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of Jehovah. And Joshua said to all the people, watch what he says here. Behold, this stone, this is going to be a reminder, this stone that I just placed here, shall be a witness to us. For it has heard all the words Jehovah of Jehovah, which he spoke to us. And it shall therefore be a witness to you. This stone will re remind you of this day. You, you said it, folks. I told you, you can't serve him. You insist you can. But when you break his law, be reminded, I told you. I told you. Right? This stone shall be a witness to us, for it has heard all the words of Jehovah, which he spoke to us. It shall therefore be a witness to you, lest you deny your God. So Joshua let the people depart, each to his own inheritance. Now you understand their problem. Notice again what I've been saying the Bible teaches. You have a sinful nature that binds you to breaking God's law. But because you still have the image of God in you, it hasn't been erased. It hasn't been effaced completely. There's the desire to want to be religious, a desire to want to obey God, a desire to submit to him. But the ability to act on it, it's not there because sin constantly makes you go against what you want to do and constantly forces you to break the law. So where was their mistake? Their mistake was in not realizing how corrupt their human condition truly is. They thought they could obey God and carry the law. And what Joshua was saying, no, you can't. And they says, no, we can in other words, they were like the Jews of Jesus' day who thought they could do the law to God's satisfaction and they didn't need the grace of Jesus. That's their sin. But had they said, yes, we are not able to do it. Please, God, have mercy. We can't do it, but we want to because we love you, but we can't because of our human condition, our sinfulness. God would have then bestowed upon them the grace of Jesus Christ and give them the spirit to seal them for the day of redemption. You with me there? Their sin was the sin of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were religious, spiritual, and tried to live the law. And they thought they could live the law to God's satisfaction. That was the sin of the Israelites at the time of Joshua. And Joshua says, you still don't get it, do you? You don't get it, right? Don't you understand? You cannot possibly serve God to God's delight and satisfaction. Don't you get it? Don't you understand? You need God's grace to save you. You need God to be your savior and the spirit to make you alive and to seal you. And you need a provision for your sin, the cross of Jesus Christ. No, they still didn't get it. So why did God give the law? The law was given, number one, to show you what sin is. Let me repeat it. The law was given to show you what sin is. Number two, the law was given to show you because of sin in your flesh, because of your sinful condition, you can never carry out God's law so that it then prepares you for point three, your need for a savior and your desperate cry for salvation. You know what the problem is? People think they are not so sinful 
as to be incapable of doing the law to God's satisfaction, and therefore they're not in need of the Savior, Jesus Christ. And that was the sin of the Jews at the time of Christ. And that's the sin of Jews like Tobias Singer till this day. And that's the sin of the Muslims who don't think that they need Jesus, the Son of God, to do for them what they cannot do for, them, for themselves by paying their debt of sin by his cross and living the righteous life that they're supposed to, but they can't, which he did in their place, which he then gives to them as a gift when they trust in him. So if all of this made sense, you see now why you need to be born again, right? Do you want me to give you another example of a man who wasn't saved, meaning born again, but because he bore the image of God and had God's law written in his heart, he realized he needed to worship the true God and turn to the true God and God saw his sincerity in that as the spirit worked in his conscience, the law in his heart and the image that he bore, the spirit working. And as he yielded to the spirit's conviction in his heart and sought the true God, God then honored, honored him with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I show you that? Cornelius. Yes, Cornelius. Cornelius, Acts chapter 10, verses 1 to 8. Acts chapter 10, verses 1 to 8. Cornelius. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man. And one who feared God with all his household. Folks, the man wasn't saved. How could he fear God? Who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour, which was the Jewish time of prayer. It was the evening time of prayer. Evening prayer and sacrifice. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius! And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? Meaning, sir. He said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Folks, he wasn't saved. He wasn't saved. Now send men to Joppa and send to Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner whose house is by the sea, he will tell you what you must do. And when the angel had spoke to him, he spoke to him, had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. Now notice verse 8. So when he had explained all these, these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now watch what happens here. Watch what happens here. Cornelius was a pagan Roman who ended up worshiping the God of Israel. And he ended up observing the customs of the Jews, praying at the ninth hour, which was the evening time of prayer and sacrifice in the temple, giving alms and crying out to the God of Israel. But he wasn't born again. He wasn't saved. And yet God saw his prayers, his fasting, his alms, and then honored that. By sending him an angel to tell him, God has heard you, and now he's going to bring you the message of salvation. Now let's go to Acts 10 and read verses 17 to 20. Peter has seen a vision, a vision in which a table spread comes down with clean and unclean animals. He sees it three times, and he hears a voice saying, get up, kill, and eat. And Peter says, I haven't eaten anything unclean. God says, don't call anything unclean or common that God makes clean. And he didn't understand what that meant. Why is God telling me these unclean animals are not unclean anymore and stop calling them unclean? What does this vision mean? Three times, the same vision. What are you trying to tell me, God? Notice three times. Clean animals, unclean animals. God is saying they're no longer unclean. They're all clean in my sight. 
Stop calling them unclean. What does that mean, God? Let's read. Acts 10, 17 to 20. Let's read. Now, while Peter wondered, wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, what did it mean? Behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house. So the three men from Cornelius came and they find him. Notice God's timing. Folks, look at God's perfect sovereign timing. When do they appear? When he sees the vision, the vision is over. They don't come before the vision. They don't come during the time he sees the vision. They come right when the vision is done. And you tell me God is not sovereignly in control over creation? Why did he see the vision three times? Let's catch it. Okay. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the spirit said to him, notice the spirit said to him, behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Wow. That's a lot of meat. Okay, let's repeat it again. Peter sees a vision three times of unclean animals. God says, go eat the unclean animals. Peter says, I haven't eaten anything unclean or common. God says to him, don't call any animal unclean. They're all clean. Peter awakens from the vision and he's wondering, what is God trying to tell me? And when do the three Gentiles come? The two servants of Cornelius and the soldier? Notice they're Gentiles. Three. When do they come? Not before the vision, not during the time he sees the vision. They come when the vision is done. They arrive right when it's done because God is absolutely almighty over creation. He's in control. You catching that now? Sargon, what is true? See, now you're distracting me. Repeat it. Okay, now with that said, with that said, Pay attention here. With that said, how many, many, how many men show up? How many men show up to Peter's home? Three. Who spoke to Peter? The Holy Spirit. Notice the Holy Spirit said, there are three men looking for you. Get up and go. Do not delay. I have sent them. Two facts. The Holy Spirit is the one who commands the church what to do. He commands Peter, go, do it. And the Holy Spirit is the one who brings people to salvation. I have brought them to you. You see again what I kept saying earlier? The Spirit works to convict your heart with the law written in your heart and that image in which you bear. The Spirit uses that to convict you. And then the Spirit is the one who brings you, if you respond to that conviction, to the message of salvation. So it shows you the Holy Spirit is almighty. He, like the Father and the Son, is almighty. He is Lord over creation, over the church. He tells believers what to do, when to do it, how to do it. And he's the one bringing people to salvation. Let's look at it again. Acts 10, 19 to 20. Acts 10, 19 and 20. Let's look at it again. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. You go. Don't hesitate. I'm telling you what to do because I'm your God and your Lord. Who's saying that? The Spirit. So the Spirit speaks. He's a person who is God, one with the Father and the Son. And you know why you go? I sent them to you. I brought them to you. So what do you see here? The Holy Spirit is God. He's a divine person. He is Lord over creation, Lord over the church. He's the one who raises up teachers and preachers. And he's the one who brings people to hear these teachers and preachers to learn and get saved. Amazing meat and depth in scripture. Oh, hold on. My, my computer's about to die. Oops. Oops.
Lord, almost. almost. Okay, now. Remember, he saw the vision of unclean animals three times, and three times God said to him, don't call them unclean. You know why three? Because three Gentiles, each one of the vision represented these three. Because in Jewish tradition, you could not enter the home of a Gentile because if you entered, you could be defiled because they're considered unclean. And God says, stop calling Gentiles unclean because I'm going to cleanse them by the blood of Jesus and make them clean with you Jews because all of you will be cleansed by the blood of Christ and one in Christ. Let me show that to you. Let's pick it up at Acts 10. Let's read 21 to 24. We're going to end it with a bang. Acts 10, 21 to 24. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you see. For what reason have you come? Now watch what they say. And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a just man. One who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nations of the Jews was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. They invited them and in and lodged them. On the next day, Peter went away with them and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the following day, they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Now let's read Acts 10, 25 all the way to 20, yeah, 28. Let's go to 28. Let's go to 28. Watch here. I'm breaking this now. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up. I myself am also a man. Don't you give me such honor. I don't deserve it. Now watch this. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Here is the answer to the vision. Then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Bam, there you go. Why three times? For the three Gentiles. God is saying, you as a Jew need to stop. Viewing the Gentiles as unclean. Do you know why, Peter? Because I will purify them by the blood of Jesus like I purified you Jews. And see them as one with you. Now let's read Acts 10. 29 to 33. Acts 10, 29 to 33. Now watch what's going to happen, folks. Therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked them, for what reason have you sent for me? So Curly said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I said, look, I was fasting. I prayed in my house and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. So the angel appears as a man. He looks human, bright clothing. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, right? Immediately. And you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we, all, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. Now it gets beautiful. Now it gets beautiful. 34 and 35. You guys ready? You getting excited? Lord, bring 300 next time to these sessions for your glory. Acts 10, 34, 35. Watch here. Jelda. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, here's what I want you to park on. In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Remember this because I'm going to come back to this. God is not partial. He's impartial. He loves all the nations. And when he sees among the nations people seeking him, he shows up and saves them. 
And now notice Peter begins preaching the gospel. Acts 10, 36 to 43. Acts 10, 36 to 43. Acts 10, 36 to 43. Exactly, Vine. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. He preaches the gospel. That word, you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. So I'm about to cry here, man. <clears throat> I'm about to, yeah, I'm going to be moved in my spirit for the glory of Jesus. Who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. The Father was with him. The Holy Spirit was with him. The Godhead working on earth through the physical body of Jesus. Now watch here. Watch here. Let's read. And we are witnesses. Of all things which he did both in land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. He's physically alive, Cornelius. He's not physically immortal, can never die. He's destroyed death. How do, you, how do we know? We saw him. We touched him. We sat with him. We ate with him after he came back to life. And I, I saw it, Cornelius. I saw my Lord alive. And I'm willing to die for that. All right Now watch here. Watch what he says. And he commanded us. Jesus commanded us to preach to the people, to testify that he is, that it is he who was ordained by God. Ordained by God to judge to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, Jesus, all the prophets, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Isaiah, all of them bear witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Tell me the gospel wasn't preached right there. Old Testament prophesied Messiah would come, would die on the tree, would be killed, God would raise him to life and exalt him, making him Lord of all, the judge of the living and the dead, and you need to believe in him and embrace his name to be forgiven of your sins. That's the gospel. And what happens? <clears throat> Acts 10, 44 to 48. Acts 10, 44 to 48. And I'm going to sum it up because i got to sum up everything. I'm going to sum up everything. Now watch here. This is where I'm getting moved in my heart. Guys, pay attention here. This is where I'm getting moved in my heart. Look, actually your mother and your father and your children will be beheaded and will spit on them in their graves and the grave of your prophet, that filthy dog. You won't touch my daughters. I'll bury you in hell with your prophet. Glory to Jesus Christ. Now watch here. Acts 10, 44 to 48. He just threatened to behead my daughters as if I'm scared. While Peter was still speaking these words, guys, pay attention. That was the son of Satan, the dog of Satan, whom Jesus has crushed by his cross, by his blood, by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Now watch this. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. So they heard and the Spirit came down upon them. And those of the circumcision, meaning the Jews, who believed were astonished. They were shocked. As many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Now watch this. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered. And Peter answered. Can anyone forbid water? that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked them to stay a few days. Guys, let me sum up what you just read. Cornelius and his household were not saved until they heard the gospel. As they heard the gospel, they believed in their heart. And as they believed in their heart, 
the Holy Spirit came upon them and then enabled them to speak in tongues as a miraculous sign to the Jews. They're now made alive, born of the Spirit, born again, and they belong to Jesus Christ. Okay, now, here is what I want you to take away from this. Even before Cornelius was saved, he was doing things pleasing to God. He was a Gentile who gave up the gods and goddesses of his ancestors, the Romans, and knew the God of Israel is the true God. And he started worshiping the true God. So the, the spirit was working in Cornelius. Watch where I'm going with this. Pay attention here. Pay attention to this. Watch where I'm going with this. Here's a man dead in sin. He's not alive. In bondage to sin. But because he still has the law of God in his heart. And he bears the image of God. He still has the desire to know the true God and worship him. Though sin is enslaving him and preventing him from being able to live up to God's standards, to God's satisfaction. But still the Spirit is using that conviction, using that image to convict him, to move him and show him that's the God you need to worship. And what does Cornelius do? Yield. And as he's worshiping God, the Spirit takes his prayers and his alms to God. And God sees the sincerity of his heart. Though his works cannot merit salvation, though his works cannot justify him, still his works being prompted by the Spirit, though he's still in sin, are being offered to God. Because what did the angel say? Your alms have come up to God as a memorial. Do you remember what he said? So God is still looking upon those imperfect works done in a state of sin, but still prompted by the Spirit. And God is mercy is looking at that man and seeing that man instead of resisting the Spirit, yielding to the Spirit and says, I will now send you the gospel. And when the gospel comes, that same Spirit is working in him to hear and receive and bam, he's made alive. And sin no longer controls him. He now belongs to Jesus Christ. Catch out is. So I take what the Bible teaches as a whole. This is the teaching of the Bible in regards to our sinful condition. You got to go back. Re-listen to part five and re-listen to part six. You need to listen to parts five and six over and over again because I'm trusting the spirit that I explain these issues correctly and accurately and he saved me from any errors. And if I made mistakes, may correct it to me not to repeat them and save you from those mistakes for the glory of Jesus. But you need to re-listen to part five and this, part six, because here's the message of the Bible as a whole. Because of Adam and Eve, all their descendants are born with a sinful inclination, sinful tendency, a sinful nature that resides in the members of our flesh, our flesh body. The Bible is clear that up until a certain point, we are unaware of God and his law. And because we are ignorant of God and his law and don't know the difference between right and wrong, God looks upon us in mercy and compassion and love and pity. And because we're not aware of the law, sin remains dormant in our body. And we're alive until we become aware of the law and God's demands upon us. Once we come to that realization, that's when sin springs to action, makes us break the law. So it's inevitable that we end up sinning, we end up dying, we end up standing condemned because sin makes it impossible for us to do the law to God's satisfaction. With that said, because we're created in the image of God and sin hasn't erased that image in us, there's that desire within us to want to please God and submit to God, but we're not able to act upon it. And so now there is this conviction that I don't want to sin, but I can't help to sin. 
And there's that misery and conviction. Why, God? Why am I sinning against you? Because the Spirit is using that to convict you. The Spirit is using that to prick your conscience. You're sinning. You, you need to stop sinning. You need to be saved. You need to be set free, but you can't do it. So you need God to do it. And God has done it in Jesus Christ. So cry out to him. Cry out for salvation and ask him to save you. And that's when he gives you the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you hear, the spirit produces faith in you to believe and receive and submit. But there is a flip side, a danger side. The more you succumb to sin and the more you resist that convicting work of the Holy Spirit in your heart and your conscience, then you can reach a point where you could care less about the image of God in you, could care less about the law written in your conscience, could care less about the Spirit convicting you, and now delight in your sin, indulge your sin, love your sin and are happy with your sin. So now sin defines you and you're defined by your sin and you've reached the point of reprobation where you've grieved the spirit and blasphemed him and it's over for you. So with all that said, I hope you now realize why you must be born again. Why you must have the Holy Spirit convicting you guiding you, making you alive through faith in Jesus Christ, uniting you to Christ so that you're no longer in bondage to sin. So now you can actually wage war against sin and conquer sin. The more you walk in the life of the Spirit and do what the Spirit tells you to do, the more you perform the spiritual exercises that the Spirit gives you to do to become stronger spiritually, to, to get your spiritual muscles bigger and bigger, so that you can now crucify your sinful passions more and more as you exercise more and more in union with the Spirit to become a spiritual behemoth, a spiritual Arnold Schwarzenegger, for lack of better terms and analogies. So I hope that was clear. Was that clear? Did that make sense? So do me a favor. If you are blessed and challenged, you need to re-listen to part five and part six. Re-re-listen until you understand it. And if I'm wrong, ask the Spirit to show you where I'm wrong and to show me where I'm wrong because I just want you to accept the fullness of the truth of the Scriptures. And my understanding is imperfect. My explanation is less than perfect. But I'm trusting in the perfect spirit to perfect me and you to know his word and live it up, live it out for the glory of Jesus. So I hope that's clear. So I want to end by keep saying my view doesn't do away with the Holy Spirit, God forbid. My view shows you need the Holy Spirit. And I'm not aware of any Christian tradition that says... You can turn to Christ without the Holy Spirit. I'm not aware of any Orthodox who would say that, any Roman Catholic who would say that, any Arminian who would say that. We all agree you need the Holy Spirit to be working with you, convicting your heart, convicting your conscience, and you need to then yield to that conviction of the Spirit to be made alive and empowered to overcome your flesh through faith in Jesus and your union with Christ. No tradition teaches this is done without the Holy Spirit. Because that would be blasphemy. That would be blasphemy. Now, guys, you may be in for a treat. A Mohammedan just contacted me. Let's see if he's going to come live. Oh, it's this guy, dude. You know what it is? The guy that Hatuntash has debates. His name, he goes by the name Yahya Sayed F11. I've seen him on. I seen him on her shows. Sayed, you know what I'm talking about? That older guy. Uh, this is gonna be it's gonna be a waste of time. Let's see. 
Let's see if he's here. All right, I'll set up a dialogue with him because I don't think he's nearby. I will debate him. If he comes on, he'll come on up, but I think he's not around because he contacted me during the session, and I knew that was saying trying to distract me because I didn't want to get off this topic. Okay, folks, you're in for another treat. Two hours from now, Lord Jesus willing, two hours from now, Lord Jesus willing, two hours from now, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I go live again with the Dizzle, David Wood, on the canon of the Bible. Which canon should Muslims accept? The 66 books of the Protestant Bible or the 73 of the Roman Catholic Bible? Because it's a common Muslim objection. So Lord Jesus willing, two hours from now, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, David Wood's channel, come because I want to see 1,500. I'm working to get 1,500 on my live streams. I'm not there yet, but glory to God, we're now close to 200. Pray we go over 200, right? But guys, keep praying for my health and my children's health and our protection. Keep praying that the Lord Jesus will make me holier, more in love with him, give me more wisdom and knowledge, understand his word, and pray that he gives us all the power to live his word and pray for the provisions. And please pray because my trial is still not over. God has even used COVID-19 in, in an amazing way, he's even used it as a way of even protecting me. Who would have thunk it that something so devastating can still be used by our God for something good? Pray God removes these wicked lawyers and this evil judge and convicts their mother and puts a fire in her heart to repent. Because, folks, you know what happened two nights ago when my daughter called me? You guys want to hear what happened? Because I want you to pray for me because you're my family. Guess what happened when my daughter called me on the phone? Remember my baby and she was on the phone and I asked you guys for prayer? Guess who comes on the comment section of that video using my daughter's YouTube channel? Their mother. Their mother sent a lengthy comment in my comment section on that video using my daughter's YouTube channel, right? And I can see from her words God's Holy Spirit is making you miserable, so God is hearing your prayers. Don't stop. He's You can see the misery and the conviction, but still no confession of sin. Right? Yep, Michelle. But then even worse, one of her friends, a, a, a friend who ended up divorced, she has four sons. I'm sorry, four children, three daughters and a son, who is a cop who actually used to chaperone my ex-wife when she was having an affair with her Puerto Rican boyfriend while we were still married. She chaperoned her because I had a private investigator following them and took a picture. She came on my comment section attacking me for being a deadbeat, for not supporting my daughters, right? She, and she ended up destroying her marriage. She's now divorced because she did to her husband and children what my ex-wife did. They say birds of a feather flock together. But she was too embarrassed to leave the comments, so she tried to delete it, but I already took a snapshot of her comments. Can you believe that? A woman who chaperoned my ex-wife while we're still married with her adulterous boyfriend and got caught on camera by my private investigator, who then destroys her marriage with four kids, and she's a cop, comes and attacks me, and tries to accuse me of not being godly. Can you believe the audacity of these people? No fear, no shame, no repentance. And yet they think they're embarrassing me, but they're exposing themselves to public shame. Right? Pray for the Lord to convict them and chasten them to fear the Lord. Because now they destroyed the lives of children. Okay? And I got the pictures. I saved them. I saved them. Hey, Al, you know what I'm talking about, la? You know what I'm talking about. I hope she's listening. Shame on you, claiming to be a Christian, destroying your marriage and committing adultery. And this just tells you the kind of world we live in. Someone like that can be a cop. May the Lord chasten you to repent, not to destroy you. That's not what we pray. Chasten you to repent and fear the Lord, you fake. And may you do that to my ex-wife. Sorry, guys. I'm just being honest and transparent. I'm not going to hide for their adultery and their immorality that ended up destroying families christ is risen risen indeed so i'll see you guys in two hours christ is risen and we love the lord jesus yeah and uh, sean suretela they're both assyrians sean they're both assyrians look at the day that we live where we have a syrian woman doing things 
that just 10 years ago, we would have been shocked to hear any Assyrian woman doing. But that's the time we live in. May the Lord Jesus chasten both of them. Lord, chasten them not to destroy them. Chasten them to fear you for their salvation. Guys, see you in two hours. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Love you. And Jesus loves you more.